Hey, welcome to the Eddie Height Podcast. I'm your teacher and host, Eddie Height, and I'm so glad you've joined me today. Hey, we've missed a few days of these uh, of these episodes because Sue and I have been moving into a larger space that will accommodate uh, the advances that God has brought into our lives, uh, new studio equipment for streaming, broadcasting, and so we hope to have that set up by uh, by the end of this month. And so we're still unboxing things and getting our library set up, getting the studio set up and, and um, you know, our kitchen things and just everything that is needed for living. So anyway, thank you for being patient with us. And uh, I am going to resume today with our series on Hebrews. What an exciting letter as we begin to unpack it. What incredible truths there are. And we're over to chapter 3. So I want to talk about chapter 3 today. And uh, in chapter 3, you know, in chapter 1 and 2, the writer of Hebrews was emphasizing that God is greater, I'm sorry, that Jesus is greater than angels. Yes, God is greater than angels too. But this whole letter, as we talked about at the very beginning, uh, is written to Jewish believers to encourage them and to warn them because they had come under persecution uh, for their faith in Jesus and because the Roman Empire had given the Jews uh, freedom to practice their own religion, uh, but they had not the Christians. And in the beginning, because Christianity began in Jerusalem, with Jews who recognized Jesus as the Messiah, well, they enjoyed, Jewish believers in the Messiah, Jesus, they enjoyed the protection of the Roman Empire towards the Jewish people. However, as the as Christianity spread into the Gentile world, and then it became obvious that this was a movement separate from Judaism, and Christians came under persecution, well, Jewish believers... Uh, especially outside of Israel, they came under those same persecutions. So many of them were tempted to give up their faith in Jesus in order to avoid the persecutions and to just going back and being good Jews and and um, and, and living in, in Judaism. So this letter was written to both encourage and to warn. And one thing we see throughout the letter is how that this this, this new covenant, is better than the old covenant, that everything about the new is an advance on the old. And uh, in chapters one and two, the writer emphasized, among other things, that Jesus is greater, the Messiah is greater than angels. Now here he's going to emphasize, and as we start reading in chapter three, that Jesus is greater than Moses. Now Moses is perhaps, probably for Orthodox Jews, the most exalted and esteemed uh, 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 person in their history of their ancestors. Uh, this became very real to me many years ago. I was uh, talking to a Jewish businesswoman. She was a widow. I'm going to guess she was in her 50s. I was much younger at the time. And uh, and so uh, the reason I was talking to her, we were she had a house for sale and we were considering buying her house. And so we had uh, several conversations with her. And so I ventured to talk to her about Jesus, and I'll tell you more about that later. But uh, one thing she said to me when I first brought up the subject of Jesus, she said, you don't think he's greater than Moses, do you? (laughs) Oh, well, of course I do, because I knew I had come to the realization of, of who Jesus is. He is the fulfillment. He is the summation of all that the Old Testament speaks about. The Old Testament, the, the entire Old Testament was written to lead the Jewish people and now to the people of the world, to the Messiah, to the Savior, to Jesus Christ. He is the goal of the Old Testament. He is the goal of all creation. So yes, he is greater than Moses. And this is... Uh, what the writer is saying in verse three. Let's just begin reading here and I will comment on it. He says, therefore, holy brethren. Now he calls them holy because you see, we have been made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ through our faith in him. 
Now, the word holy in Scripture does not refer to a certain state of moral perfection. Uh, the word holy, the Greek word hagias, it means to be marked off and set apart for a special purpose. And so you and I have been marked off and set apart for God's special purpose. And, and, and Paul will often, he will, he will exhort the Christians to, to live up, to walk worthy and to live up to this holy calling that you have, see, uh, you have received because God has marked you for a special purpose. He's called you. He has set you apart for a special purpose. You're not just like everybody else. You have a special purpose and destiny in life, and now you need to walk uh, worthily of that destiny and calling that God has given you. So therefore, holy brethren, the Greek word is a adelphoi, and it referred to both men and women. That's why the NIV, I'm reading from the New King James, but that's why the NIV says, therefore, holy brothers and sisters, partakers of the heavenly calling. You see, we share in this heavenly calling. We share in the heavenly calling of Jesus Christ. He has made us a part of his family. And so we share uh, in, in his destiny and his calling. Partakers of the heavenly calling consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. The word apostle means one who is sent, an official representative, and of course a high priest is, is one who goes to God on behalf of others. So Jesus is the one whom God has sent. Not Mohammed, not Buddha, not any other religious leader, Jesus is the ultimate one, the representative of God. If you want to know what God is like, just look at Jesus. He is the apostle and he's also the high priest. Not only is he the one that God sent to us, but he is the one who goes to God on our behalf. He is the apostle and high priest of our confession. And he says that he was faithful to him, appointed him as Moses. Now here he's going to give the contrast to Moses as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. This one, talking about Jesus, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. The Greek word here is, is oikos, and it, 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 it doesn't just mean a building, it refers to a household. And in those days, a household could be hundreds, maybe thousands of people, depending upon uh, the wealth and status of, of the householder, because it could uh, include not only immediate family, children, but it could include aunts and uncles and cousins, servants and slaves and their families. And so a household could be a very large. And so here he's saying that this one, is worthy of more honor than Moses in as much as he who builds the household is worthy of more honor than the household itself. Moses was a part. He was faithful in God's household. But Jesus said, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And church is a, you, you could say that it is a, uh, uh, it is used in, in the same manner it is used in the same way as household. A, a, a church, the Greek word ecclesia, is a gathering together. A household is a gathering of people who belong to this certain household. And so Jesus is the builder of the household. So he has he is worthy of more honor than Moses. Now, I want to get in. We're not going to be able to today, but we're going to get in to, to the scripture here. It talks about how uh, Moses was not able to, to bring them into their place of rest into Canaan because they rebelled. And he tells us at the end of the chapter that there remains therefore a rest to the people of God. And we can only find that rest of faith in Jesus. We cannot find that rest of faith in Moses. This is the point he's going to make. We cannot find that rest of faith in Moses in the Old Testament law. We can only find this rest of of faith in Jesus. And I will close this by reading the words of Paul 
in Romans chapter 10, amazing uh, words that I think that sums up what the writer of Hebrews is saying to us. And in Romans chapter 10, verse 4, Paul says, For Christ is the end of the law. The word, the English word end is teleos. And it doesn't mean the cessation. It means the destination or the goal. And so Paul says Christ is the destination. He is the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So Moses, Elijah, David, all of the Old Testament prophets, Moses, all of them, their purpose, their goal, ultimately, now they didn't know exactly what their goal was, but now we see in retrospect, and this is made clear in the Gospels, their goal was to lead people to the Messiah. He is the end. He is the goal. And he is our end and goal. As Paul also said that his great consuming passion in life was that I may know him. He is our goal and he must be the goal and destination of every Christian and of every church. If he is not the destination and goal of helping people to know him, then we are totally missing it. Maybe I will close with this quote from C.S. Lewis. Let me see if I can remember it. He says, uh, he says the, the, the purpose of the church is to bring men and women to Christ. And he says, to make them like Christ. And if we are not doing this, if the church is not doing this, then all of our cathedrals and buildings and sermons and, and choirs, and he said, and even the Bible itself is a waste of time if we are not doing this one vital important thing of bringing men and women to Christ and helping them to become like Christ because he is the goal. I'm Eddie Hyatt. This is the Eddie Hyde Podcast. So glad you're joining me for this study in Hebrews. Uh, check out my website, eddiehyatt.com. If you'd like to be in contact with me, my contact information is there. Send me an email if we can pray with you about anything. Be glad to join with you in prayer. Um, follow me on, on uh, uh, Twitter. Uh, friend me on Facebook and follow me on Facebook. And I'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. God bless.